You can please use the chat window as well to ask questions. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions to be addressed uh, during the general Q&A session at the end, but keep in mind that due to time constraints, we might not get to every question. So Paul, go ahead and let me, oh, are we starting now? We have recorded, okay. All right. So again, welcome, 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 and thank you so much for joining us to, for tonight's reading, uh, where we will be hosting Amy Butcher, acclaimed writer of the latest book, Mother Trucker. Here is a ver uh, copy of the uh, book. Go find it. Go read it if you have it already. It is wonderful. I close out of this PowerPoint presentation real quick, which I never thought I would say. <laughs> we usually we've done these in other forms, Amy, usually in Ring Central and stuff. So it, we have to be kind of the tech gurus on our side this time, too, which is unusual. So thank you so much for being here and for for being the first person to <laughs> try out the team space with us. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce you and then I'll, I'll hand it over to you to read uh, from your work. Wonderful, thank you. Excellent. So again, Paul and I are thrilled to have Amy Butcher as our guest today. Uh, Amy is an award-winning essayist and author of Mother Trucker, a book that interrogates the realities of female fear, abusive relationships, and America's quiet epidemic of intimate partner violence set against the geography of remote Northern Alaska. The book earned critical, play, cri critical praise from Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, The Wall Street Journal, Good Morning America, CBS News, The Chicago Review of Books, The Oxford Review of Books, Booklist, and many others. <laughs> the book has also been optioned by Make Ready Films for film development with primetime Emmy winning Joey Soloway directing, an Academy and Global, Golden Globe winning actress Julianne Moore, and Golden Globe nominee Beanie Feldstein in starring roles. Amy's first book, Visiting Hours, also earned starred reviews and praise from the New York Times Sunday Review of Books and NPR, among others. Her work has been featured on National Public Radio and the BBC, anthologized in Best Travel Writing 2015, and awarded the grand prize in the 2016 Solas Awards Best of Travel Writing series. In 2014, her essay, Reenacting, won the Iowa Review Award, as judged by David Shields, and her essays have been awarded notable distinctions in the 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 2020, and 2021 editions of the Best American Essay Series. Amy is also the Director of Creative Writing and an Associate Professor of English at Ohio Wesleyan University a writing instructor here at Southern New Hampshire University's MA program, and an annual instructor at the Iowa Summer Writing Festival and the Sitka Fine Arts Camp in Sitka, Alaska. She lives in Ohio with her three rescue dogs. Thank you so much for reading uh, uh, for us tonight, Ray, Amy. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, just before I get started, I just wanna say thank you to Jacob, thank you to Paul, thank you to Diane um, and everyone behind the scenes who helped to make this event possible. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you too, to all of you for tuning in and joining me. Um, I uh, The participants list here is long, but just as I was scrolling through, um, I see at least two of my former students and current students. Um, so shout out to Rebecca, shout out to Michelle. It's really nice to see you here. Um, and thank you for coming everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Um, I've been teaching for Southern New Hampshire University off and on since I earned my master's uh, in nonfiction writing in 2012. Um, and I worked, uh, I really taught quite a bit uh, when I first completed my degree um, and then took some time off to work on my first uh, my first book and, and really solidifying things and then returned, uh, gosh, two years or so ago. Um, yeah. So it's been a really wonderful experience. Um, sorry, the, the thank you so much um, for that message, Rebecca. Um, but it's been a really wonderful experience and I feel very passionate about the work that I get to do through Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I remember when I was in graduate school, the genre creative nonfiction felt so ambiguous to me. I was so consumed with how to find my voice, what my voice was. Um, so many, I think, anxieties that I tend to identify with our students. And um, for me, I think it is so important to be transparent about as much of the process as I can be. So I'm going to read briefly um, from Mother Trucker, my new book, which came out November 1st. 
Um, but I'm also going to talk, uh, I've selected readings tonight that I think would be trying to put myself in my student's shoes, what would be helpful to know um, about writing a book. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that. Um, and then, of course, we have a Q&A. And I, I just want to be super transparent. Um, I, I think as an educator, as a writer, as someone who is constantly thinking about the genre and publishing, um, I, I like to be as transparent as possible. So if you have questions um, related to any of that, um, I really am a pretty open book to the extent that I can answer your question and help you. I would, I would love to do that. Um, so the reading I'm going to uh, give tonight, I'm going to start from um, really the very beginning of the book. And if you're familiar with the story, that's great. If you're not, I'm here to hold your hand. Um, essentially, the book began as a profile about a woman that I met on Instagram of all places, um, sort of mindlessly scrolling after my day job. Uh, and I, I essentially came upon this Instagram account by a woman um, whose handle was Alaska Mother Trucker. And I became very fascinated with her world. Um, and ultimately, uh, as, both as a writer and as an individual, I wanted to learn more about her. And she seemed like a subject that was rich uh, for writing. And so I reached out to her um, with the expectation that I was writing a book only about her. I was coming off of my first book, Visiting Hours, which is a memoir. It was deeply personal, deeply intimate, um, explored a lot of really ethically sensitive topics um, and it just in some way felt like ripping the skin off my chest and burying everything inside of me and I, I didn't want to do that a second time. Um, I also was aware of some of the criticism of the genre about navel gazing and writing something that is so deeply obsessed with oneself um, and I, I think there's a lot of value to memoir and I reject that general assumption um, but I also you know I wanted to write something that was different and was less personal. And so when I set out to write this book, I really thought that I was writing what I was calling at the time um, my badass trucking book. It was going to be about this woman who was a, a, a haul road driver on a deadly highway in Alaska, and it was a, completely about her, and I would have no part in the book. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning um, when that was, this is, not only does it fall in the very beginning of the book, but it also falls, it was some of the earliest writing that I did for the book. Um, and I should say it wasn't the beginning of the book initially, uh, but it is now. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to talk about the way in which this project changed for me, which I think is the, the most important advice that I have for my students is to be open to the possibility that the book you're writing is not the book that you want to write, nor is it the book that you think you're writing. Um, I think once you put something down on the page, it becomes an entirely new um, monster uh, or you know, lovely creature, but it has a mind of its own and it has agency and it has urgency and it kind of tells you what to write. So this is from the very beginning. This is from chapter one. Um, and I'm just gonna start here and then I'm gonna kind of uh, jump to the middle of the book and talk about what changed. And I promise these readings are short. So chapter one. It is only in the Columbus airport a few weeks later, buffered by the sweet smell of Auntie Anne's and the particular fluorescence of industrial lighting that I allow myself to consider what a ludicrous thing it is that I am doing. I am flying clear across the country to meet a woman that I met on the internet, an Alaskan I've discovered on Instagram, an Arctic ice road trucker who goes by the handle Mother Trucker. Despite my obsession, she is still mostly a stranger, no different from the men and women who idle beside me in the John Glenn Airport, coveting their premier spots beside the outlet chargers or trying to secure their 10,000 steps or complaining loudly about standby wait lists to smiling customer service representatives who have been trained to excel in empathy. I too am trying to excel in empathy. I think this sense of openness, this sense of understanding will help when I meet Joy. When we are alone in the cocoon of her truck cab for what Joy tells me will be 14 hours minimum, but could easily expand to 48, depending, Joy says, on the weather or other truckers or the Sagavernatok River or even the road itself. The James W. Dalton Highway is the most dangerous road in America. 414 miles of gravel and occasional pavement that extends north from Fairbanks, Alaska to the industrial town of Dead Horse and the oil fields of Prudhoe Bay. More drivers die on that road annually than anywhere else in our America, in no small part because its miles are subjected to the worst of mother nature. 
It is built on desolate remote terrain that often gets washed out or slicked with ice or glazed so thoroughly by late spring snow that the path ahead disappears, obscuring what is ground and what is air, what is road and what is tundra. And in that difference, sometimes a life disappears as well. The truth is I've been looking for a savior and Joy Mother Trucker came to me like a dream through the well-lit lens of Instagram. Each photo, another night, excuse me, another door that at night I'd escaped down and through. Joy is an Instagram celebrity, although she would never call herself that. They just like my photos, she told me the first time we spoke. I found her account one wintry evening while scrolling innocuously past photos of perfectly plated pasta and beautiful children with sweet, sleepy cowlicks, well-designed white living rooms and handsome golden doodles. Freshly 50 with the face of Kate McKinnon and a body like an exclamation mark, compact, lean, and somehow commanding the world's attention. Joy is the nation's only female ice road trucker, a woman who has built a life driving big rigs on the James W. Dalton Highway and documenting its beauty, rare and natural, snow glazed and blue. Joy calls that cold place heaven. She says the highway is downright holy. She seems like God to me. And while my itinerary may bridge the divide that separates two strangers and brings our two very different worlds together, as the airport terminal fills with people, I realize all I know of Joy is a series of stark bullet points I have shaped into character. I know, for example, that she is petite with long brown hair and looks like the kind of person who could make a very fine rustic soup, something with potatoes and red lentils, stewed kale and the half moons of carrots. I know she has a 17-year-old daughter, Samantha, and is decades deep into her second marriage. I know her family lives outside of Fairbanks on a plot of wilderness with a mule and at least one horse and more dogs than I can keep track of in a cabin her family built together after the first cabin they built burned down. Joy told me that they chose that plot of land for its isolation and spectacular views. And in the photos that she sent me, our occasional dispatches over the past two weeks, since I placed my call and then purchased my ticket, her mule is teething against its bridle before a forest glazed slick with snow. A Samoyed puppy, a cloud of white, is bounding across a pasture, its paws stained green from grass. Joy's 18-wheeler shines in the driveway, freshly washed and waxed, a handsome blue. It is in this truck that Joy undergoes her transformation, becoming a little less Joy Ruth Weeby and a little more Mother Trucker a name her son Daniel suggested as an Instagram handle that became in time a lived persona, followed by over 11,000 Instagram users. I have imagined much about Joy, but I know her highway better. The James W. Dalton Highway is the longest stretch of serviceless road in North America and a geographical landmark that has been documented at length, thank God, in books and on the internet, in television and in film. According to my sources, Wikipedia primarily, but also Alaska's Bureau of Land Management, Alaska.org, The New York Times, and the very sexy DangerousRoads.org, it has been called, quote, the most dangerous road in America, and quote, the most isolated road in America, and what I am most interested in, quote, the loneliest road in America. But to Joy, it is God's country. His land is what she calls it. Because you feel him when you are here, she told me the first time we spoke, and you're not beholden to any man. So as I said, these were some of the first um, paragraphs that I wrote for this book when I still believed that it was just a book about joy, about the Dalton Highway, about northern Alaska. Um, I actually was kicking around the language of it's, it's about the industrial oil fields, um, which if you've read the book, it's not about the oil fields. Um, and it's about joy, but to an extent. You don't learn anything, for example, about how to drive an 18 wheeler, or you don't even really learn a whole lot about trucking in Alaska. Um, I thought at the time that that's what the book was going to be. Um, but in the act of writing the book, I came to realize um, that it was about something very different, which is to say, when I set out to write about joy, um, I was experiencing something in my personal life that I really had no idea how to properly talk about it myself, what language to give it. Um, and therefore, I wasn't really offering that language to anyone else, which is to say that I was in a relationship, um, a several uh, a relationship that was several years old at that point. 
Um, and my partner was abusive and I was not yet talking about it as abuse. I was using, I think, the codified language that we often use when we're beginning to dip our toes into these sorts of pools um, where I was saying that it was unhealthy, that it was toxic, um, that there was a lot of fighting. Right. Um, but part, I think, of my fascination as a human and as a writer with joy was that, you know, we all are familiar with the cultivated persona on social media. Joyce was one of incredible strength um, and complexity and beauty. And she seemed like a very strong woman in all senses of the word. And, and as a writer, I think that was really attractive to me. It was also attractive to me how different we were. Um, I mean, I, I, in my head, shared very, very little uh, with Joy Ruth Weeby, Mother Trucker. Um, and that actually made me all the more excited to write about her um, because I wanted to push myself to do something different. Upon flying up to Alaska, meeting Joy and traveling with Joy, you know, as a writer, I'm constantly thinking, like, how do I get an interesting story out of this particular individual? And so, you know, what were basic questions? Why do you work this highway? Why do you put yourself at constant risk on this road? Um, what is it like to be a woman in this male dominated industry, in this male dominated landscape? Um, and it really didn't take long at all. It took all of five minutes for Joy to talk to me about the fact that she felt safer in her truck on this highway than she did very often uh, in her own home. Um, Joy revealed very quickly that her first marriage was abusive um, and that she had two boys uh, with this individual and worried about raising them in a home where they saw this as an acceptable way to treat a woman. And so she divorced this first marriage, uh, this first husband, um, and turn to trucking as a way to provide for herself. Uh, it, it obviously uh, affords a certain kind of lifestyle that, as she said by her own admission, she could never afford working an office job in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and she also said that it, it allowed her to feel close to her God. She was really spiritual. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, I was not. I, uh, I was sort of agnostic, atheist a little bit, um, but I appreciated sort of the way in which Joy had imagined um, what this this job would entail for her. And the more that I pressed on why do you continue to do this work, um, I, Joy and I found ourselves in a conversation, and I don't think this is giving very much away at all, um, but we found ourselves in a conversation where I was able to open up about what I was experiencing in my own home, and Joy opened up in turn about what she was still experiencing now in her second marriage. And so at some point in the process of writing this book, I realized that my story was the catalyst and the fuel for setting out on this journey. Um, and I think as much as I didn't want the book to have any personal element, I began to see the value of here are two remarkably different individuals in terms of faith and political ideology, the way we vote, the way we think about things. But here's this common language that we speak that so many individuals speak. Um, and so I'm going to read just a very short uh, section, uh, a page or so um, from what is now the middle of the book, but was the very first piece that I wrote as a writer trying to write a book, not knowing what I was doing. Um, I gave myself permission to write a passage in which I appeared on the page and I shared some of my own story. Um, and I think the second that I did that, I realized that this book was something different than what I thought I was writing. Um, and here's that passage. I think all you need to know is that for the sake of the book, I call my partner Dave. That fall, Dave built me bookshelves and cleaved log coffee tables and tree limb disc coasters with rings and years that you could count. Time made tangible like his gifts. But the first time that he screamed at me, I cowered in our tent behind the red, excuse me, between the red rocks of Mesa Verde and the Colorado desert that stretched beyond. It was our first vacation together, our first time out of Ohio since his move, and the first time that I worried about his anger. I found myself initially mesmerized as if another person had entered his body. I couldn't believe that this was Dave. But my fascination gave way and quickly to reality. I was a woman in a desert sharing a small space with a man in rage. That night I lay awake perfectly still trying to determine if he was finally sleeping, trying hard not to make noise. Never in my life have I made myself so small, a bird burrowed in the bushes. The campfire still smoldered just outside the tiny mesh flap, but we had both become someone else. When finally the tent swelled with the morning heat, it was as if night had taken the terror with it, folded it inside the sky with the rest of the evening's darkness. He turned to me, apologized, I don't know what he said I was thinking. It's a fluke, I told myself. 
I wish I could go to that girl in the desert. I wish I could tell her that it was not a fluke. What happened in Colorado happened too in New Mexico and Oklahoma and on return visits to California. And it began to happen with increasing frequency in our small home in central Ohio, where we were just beginning to build our life. Picture our planters overrun with basil, our pantry boasting his local honey, our red plastic Adirondack chairs angled for conversation in the backyard beneath the bedroom window where on hot nights he'd rage at me. And I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Um, but I guess the, the reason, as I said, that I wanted to read from from these two passages in particular is just to emphasize this idea that sometimes I think we need to give ourselves permission to write something without knowing where it's going or how it fits into the larger story. Um, I mean, this is certainly true with Mother Trucker and it's true with my first book, which is to say that I think we sit down with this idea in our head, maybe, of what we wanna write. And then the act of writing necessitates writing around something and writing at something. And eventually I think if you can make peace with just allowing the thoughts to appear on the page without knowing where they're going, I think in some ways the material begins to hold your hand and show you what it wants to be. And I know that sounds so woo woo, um, but it's my experience of writing pretty much anything that I've set out to do. Um, and so I think again, right now I'm, I'm teaching, you know, one of the, the milestone classes 541 um, where students are just turning in these milestones and they're not sure how the pieces fit together yet. And I think to the extent that I'm able to say, just just do what you can do, write what you can write, and, and don't worry just yet about how it all is going to fit together. Give yourself freedom and flexibility to write, which is advice I can offer. But now as I turn to a third book, I'm once again in the same spot where I'm very overwhelmed with like, what am I doing and how would I talk about it? Um, but I think to the extent, again, that you can, um, giving yourself to, to just write and, and see where it goes um, and see you know whether you scrap it or you keep it, I think there's a lot to be gained um, conceptually in, in allowing yourself that luxury. Um, so I know we have questions and I'm very happy to take them. As I said, um, I've been doing this for the better part of a decade and, and I'm really happy to, to help um, any student in, in whatever capacity that I can. Well, thank you so much, Amy. That's uh, wonderful. And, and um, for, for reading those two <clears throat> sections from the book as well, um, I really like um, a, a, as folks are, are preparing their questions and stuff in the chat, I thought I'd just jump in here and stuff uh, quickly um, to get things going. Um, what you said about pushing yourself to do something different <clears throat> and how that was kind of like the catalyst to, to started the book in the first place and everything and then you know what ended up the, the product of the book itself was actually something that came along the way it mm -hmm. wasn't something that you came out and said you know i am going to go in <laughs> go interview this person i'm going to make it connect make these connections to my personal life and i'm going to talk about a much larger um, uh, issue of domestic violence and, and and the epidemic that entails and everything so what advice would you give um uh, students or, or, or uh, writers who are working on their craft, uh, like they, they may be working on something that, you know, by all intents and purposes, they 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 understand and they know, uh, but but it's but it's just like they feel like they're kind of at a stalemate. And like, how how does one push oneself to go into some a different direction to to kind of um, move away from that stalemate in in writing? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the million dollar question, right? I can give you the <laughs> pragmatic advice my own thesis director gave me when I was in graduate school, and I was very annoyed with it, um, although I would say it was a worthwhile exercise. He essentially told me to write the same page of my thesis every day for a month without ever looking at what came before. So in other words, write that same scene, which of course, you know, I'm working in, in nonfiction. So it was right. it was a particular day, a particular morning, and he wanted me to write it differently every day for 30 days without looking at the, any previous versions. Um, and I, I thought that that was such an obnoxious <laughs> exercise, to be honest with you, but I think it was ultimately so important because you realize all of these small decisions that you get to make. I mean, you're, you're basically playing God when you're writing. You're, you're I, th I think even in a genre like creative nonfiction, which so commonly people think is, is not creative, um, it's the opposite. It's, it's incredibly creative. 
Um, but you you have to decide like voice and tone and where do you open and where do you end and what do you include and what do you not include? What parts of your personality do you turn the volume up on um, and reveal on the page? What do you, you know, turn down or, or keep out? Um, and so again, I, I, at the time I thought that was such an obnoxious exercise, but he made me realize, I think like there are a million different ways to write any given thing. Um, the writer Vivian Gornick, who I, I teach a lot of and I lean on in terms of her philosophy about what we're doing here. Um, she talks specific to creative nonfiction and says that there is a, she has a book called The Situation and the Story. And the situation is the lived experience, you know, the the play by play of everything that happened in any particular time. Um, but the story are the details that you're drawing out, the emotional truth. And depending on what your story is, you're you know, you're picking and choosing what to include and what not to include. And I think that exercise made me realize like how much creativity there was in writing just even, you know, this, an hour or so uh, of material. Um, and so I think just again, like challenging yourself of how can I write this differently? How can I try this differently? Um, I mean, the other advice is pragmatic advice, which is to be reading. Um, mm -hmm. If my writing is choked up, if it's stale, if it's not interesting to me, it's probably because I'm not reading anything that inspires me. Um, so to the extent that I'm able, I mean, again, uh, we all live really busy lives, but even 10 or 15 minutes of reading each day um, and reading a variety of different authors, different genres, different voices, um, I, I really find that if I'm reading to the extent that I should be, my writing, hopefully most days, has some level of magnetism. Um, and I, I really do think you have to just constantly be, be reading and, and be listening for language and beautiful language. Yes, I I totally agree with that. I think it's it's funny on days where I, I skip reading, I, I feel different. Like I don't have as much, uh, you know, um, of energy. If it's something inspirational, that is. If, if it's something where I'm like slogging through the book and I want to get it over with as quickly as possible, that's different. But mm -hmm. um, thinking of like Tony Doerr's book and stuff, um, yeah. How Cuckoo Land, and just being so immersed in that and stuff, it, it really it really just kind of energizes you and, and stuff. So, and that can kind of complement uh, one's writing as well. So let's not forget that folks. <laughs> um, and I think this actually goes in, this this question kind of uh, feeds into a little bit um, from Rebecca. So when you were, um, when you realized you needed to plant yourself in mother trucker, like put, put yourself in that position, how far along were you already in the story? Um, and did you find that you had to go back and re-edit again uh, at that point and, and to what extent? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, my story is a little unique. And, and again, if you haven't read the book, I'm about to say something that isn't a spoiler. I mean, it, it literally, it's, it's the very first author's note um, I reveal this, but my story is a little complicated in the sense that I did this initial trip with Joy Mother Trucker in April of 2018. Um, and as a writer, I had every, you know, I, I intended to come back and do the trip again in September or October, just a few months later. Um, I thought, obviously, I, I need to shadow this individual for more than a week. Um, and for that matter, Joy and I struck up a real friendship, I think, because of our vulnerability and the shared, what I, I'm calling a shared language. Um, and so, you know, I did the trip in April of 2018. We made a plan that I would come back in September, October. We would do the drive again for a multitude of reasons. Um, and in the, the time between, um, we were texting and, and calling um, weekly, sometimes daily texting. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in August, late August of 2018, so all of what, uh, four months after our trip together, um, Joy was killed on that highway. Her uh, truck overturned um, and she was crushed instantly. And so I think when I was up in Alaska in April of 2018, having these conversations with her, I was so immersed in my own story that there was no way that I would have been able to, I think, extract myself to write about it in any sort of objective way. So I was still at that point really imagining that this was a story about joy, although, you know, she was sharing these things with me with the idea that she wanted it to be a part of her story. She didn't want to contribute to this narrative that she was just born strong and remained strong and there was nothing that, that couldn't, you know, affect her. Um, and so at that point up in Alaska, I was thinking, OK, this is about her and it's about trucking and it's mother trucker was always the title, because how can you not? But it's going to be a larger story about domestic violence and about the ways in which many individuals, but in this case, women specifically put their bodies um, directly and indirectly in harm's way as a way of 
you know, securing financial stability, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I wasn't yet on the page in my head. Um, but upon Joy passing in August, um, I mean, obviously, there's the immediate grief of losing my friend. Um, and then there's the immediate grief of losing my subject and not being able to work with her on this book, which is a whole ethical tangle in itself. But I think at that point, I also realized that I had a role in the sense that, you know, trying to explain to people how important she was to me, I don't think anybody understood until I explained like, no, I mean, she gave me advice. She gave me advice saying, get out of this relationship. It doesn't get better. I have been where you are, you know, and, and in many ways, I attribute where my life has gone since to joy, because I think, you know, this was a person who didn't owe me anything and who told me to get out. Um, and so at that point, I think I realized not only is there this issue of beyond the immediate grief, not only is there this like pragmatic issue of I can't go back and spend more time with my subject. I can't. I mean, all of the questions that I had compiled in writing these first 80 or so pages, I'm never going to know the answer. Um, I mean, I can do independent research and I can speak with her best friend, which I did, but there's only so much that I can get. Um, but at that same time, I think I was realizing like that in many ways, I think Joy's death is, um, uh, what do I want to say here? I think in many ways, Joy's death is one of many that, that again, isn't a direct um, death through domestic violence, but is the result of that consequence. Um, and so I think at that point, I just realized that the two stories had to merge. So long way of saying I was about 80 pages in um, and realized that my story had to play a role. And so I drafted that material and began to trial and error, move it around and insert it into the story and break up Joy's narrative to kind of add mine. And then at some point, the narrative sort of began to dovetail. But I, I'm not kidding when I say, I mean, I cut 40 pages, um, you know, right. it, it required substantial revision in that way. And it's interesting too, like how you had mentioned like the preface and stuff or, or at the beginning, the author's note and everything, how that that really does lay all the cards out for the reader immediately. Like it's like this is this is not so much a story about joy. We're not we're not going to talk about her extensively and get in deep into her life. We will meet her, of course, and we'll be I, I was quite entertained by her throughout it and stuff. And it was it was um, she just seemed like a, a, a view, very beautiful spark. Mm -hmm. um, just in, in all of her exchanges, even with like the housekeeper up at uh, Prudhoe Bay and just the idea of, you know, it's it's, it's fate that you're here and everything. She's it, it, really cool. Um, but yeah, the beginning that I, after reading that, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I read that, the, the author's note, and then I put the book down because it was like, whoa, that was a lot to take in all at once. I'm like, this is going to be a heavy book because it's so, um, uh, I mean, it, it lays it all out at, right at the beginning. But I think what's wonderful about that as well is that it, it does then point out something that I had noticed in the book too, where, you know, her her passing on the on the highway it comes with the job as she as she points out right in in the book but you are right that and the, right like i you you see that yourself as you're reading the book or as a as a reader mm -hmm. that um her death is in effect a, a, a side effect of that of that domestic violence that is an epidemic throughout and so like that i think that binding from just the author's note alone bringing those two stories together um is really cool so I assume that was written after words. Yeah, I mean, and, and thank you for thank you for noting that. And I mean, this kind of also ties Amanda, you asked what's your greatest struggle while writing this book. And it was the ethical struggle of like, I, you know, I started this book with a subject who told me these stories with consent, but like, she's not here to consent. And she's not here for me to show her this material and to vet it or to say yes or no, or you got this wrong. Um, and so that author's note was really important to me. It was the last thing that I wrote for the book besides um, just the, the very important legal note that I had reached out to the husband who declined to comment. Um, but it was it was this this thing that I wrote because I and I initially it was at the end of the book and I really lobbied to make it the beginning because I didn't want anybody to think that it was a narrative trick that I was using Joy's death as like, you know, all along we think she's alive and and. Um, you know, and then we get to this moment where she dies. I mean, sure, that imitates the experience, but to me, it felt like a way of using her death for a narrative trick, and I didn't want to do that. Um, so that was, luckily, I, I was I was supported by some really smart editors who agreed, um, but ethically, all of the ethical issues surrounding writing about a subject who is no longer here, 
Um, you know, I've seen a couple of messages specifically about like the husbands or the children. And, and that was also really difficult. I think, you know, there's an ethical line that with whatever work we're working on, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, whatever it is, um, we have to ask those questions of ourselves and be really honest about our own answers. Um, and so all of that, juggling all of that, I think was the most difficult thing, especially considering it started out as this like wild, you know, Alaska trucker book that was supposed to be my like happy book, as I joked to my mother. It was going to be this fun, silly, jokey book. And instead, it's it's dark and it's hard. Um, but right. I also I, I think, again, it's important to be cognizant of the way in which, again, we're, we're um, telling other people's stories and, and how we do that is our responsibility. Great. Thank you. And um, before we move on to like more more technical questions about publishing and everything, too, I was curious, like as I was reading the book, um, there was a clear like juxtaposition in, in, in religion and faith in it that that seemed to resonate throughout the book where like you have Joy on one hand who uses her religion and faith as a way to um, well, find strength in in the day to day, but also to, to she seeks miracles, right? She see, she sees every action or everything in the day as 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 a tiny miracle to continue to move on and stuff, and th that that is up against um, the ex partner Dave, who uses faith in a way to control and dominate, um, and and almost as a, as a device of of guilt and blame, like the, of, of of finding an extreme guilt and then using that as a way to blame others and stuff. Did that come naturally in the book? Like how how the how because this isn't necessarily this isn't a book where you pick up and say you know this is a, a book to read. Uh, your your Christian mother will read this book and enjoy it and everything like that. It's not it's not necessarily a religious book per se, right? It's no. but, but but religion is mentioned in it in so many different ways, and yet. You know, I, did that come yeah. naturally or how did yeah. that happen? Thank you for that. It, it yeah. makes me laugh because, you know, I was and I I'm, I am honest about this in the book. I was raised atheist. I, I kind of remain atheist. And so to have people I mean, I've had readers who said I had to put the book down. It was too preachy. Like this should be a Christian novel or something like that. Oh, it makes really? me laugh because it's <laughs> yeah. because it's so not um, what I set out to do. But but I will say. Um, I mean, the nature of my relationship with my partner, which was abusive, it, I mean, it came down to faith. And that's not to say the faith is bad. It was the way in which he perceived, interpreted, um, and and again, sort of manipulated his faith. Um, and so I think for me, that was something I was really cognizant of in the sense that I didn't know anything about Joy's faith when I flew up to Alaska to meet her. And the very first thing that she wanted to do uh, that she messaged me about was, you know, we're going to church. Do you want to come? Um, and the joke is like, no, I don't, I don't want to come. That's, that's actually the last place I want to go because of what I'm experiencing with my partner. It's a very touchy thing for me. Um, but as a writer, you know, you, you follow your subject anywhere, any experience you can get. And so it was a yes. And, and I think I was so blown away by how immediately comfortable I felt with joy and also how different her faith was. Um, and again, similar ideology, right? But it was it was love, it was kindness, it was compassion, it was generosity, it was openness. Um, and so, you know, Joy's faith was deeply important to her. It's it's why she said yes to me coming up in the first place. She saw this as something that you know had been um, orchestrated by by God, and that was not a belief that I shared. Um, but I saw the value of her religion and her faith, and. I saw it in such stark contrast to what I was understanding and interpreting and trying to explore back home. That for me, I think it, I was intentional in trying to borrow some of this language in writing the book. Um, I think also the fact that I was working on this book in 2018, so shortly after you know the 2016 election, the nation felt more polarized than it had ever been. Um, and I wanted to try to write a book where there's some sort of common ground. Um, and, and I think, again, for all of the differences between Joy and I politically, religiously, I wanted to show that this like respect is, is above all the most important thing, kindness, right? Attempting to right. understand one another. Um, so the book adopted a lot of language um, from scripture. And, and I guess I would just say that I was so steeped in this with my boyfriend that it was all this language was already, you know, percolating in my head. And so trans translating it on the page in some way as a tribute to joy and what is possible in faith or anything um, was important to me. Awesome, well, thank you, yes. Um, well, let's 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 move on to, um, uh, I, I think there's several questions that kind of address this in one way or another. Um, 
publishing. <laughs> How does one do it? How did you start? When does one know when to publish? Uh, these are all pretty common questions that we all seek out and st answers for. So, I mean, could you share a little bit of your journey with us and how, how that came to um, unfold and, and, and everything? Absolutely. Um, so I had, uh, in my graduate program, I had a, a professor who was really adamant that we not try to publish anything while in graduate school because we're really, the focus should be on trying to discover what it is you want to write about, the way in which you write about it, etc. I think that's lovely lofty advice that isn't terribly pragmatic um, because I think to get anywhere in writing and publishing you need to start small and begin to build. Um, so the more savvy advice that I would offer um, beyond focusing, yes, like focus on your craft, read a lot, write a lot, don't concern yourself necessarily um, with marketability right now or publishing, but that's not super pragmatic. The pragmatic advice that I have to offer is to begin to write shorter standalone pieces um, based on the same topic and the same subject. So with my first book, for example, um, it's a it's a I won't get into it very much, but it's a memoir about a close friend who committed a murder um, shortly after walking me home one evening. And the idea of writing a book was so daunting to me. I was really comfortable with essays, shorter form. Um, and so what I did was I wrote uh, one essay about this incident, and it was specifically focused on visiting him for the first time in prison. Um, and I just, all I knew was that I could write, I could write something meaningful in eight to 10 pages. Beyond that, it felt very overwhelming. And so I wrote this essay about visiting him in prison for the first time. Um, I used the same trick in all of my essays and my books, which I'll tell you is to write one sort of long narrative scene and then insert into it backstory, research, meditation, flashbacks, whatever it is that you need to do. But that that one short piece will provide the structure, the scaffolding, and then everything else can kind of filter in. So I wrote this essay about visiting him in prison. It was eight to 10 pages. Um, and I, at that point, I was like, this is something I think that I can publish. It's short, it's tight, it does what it needs to do. Um, I sent it around. Uh, it got picked up by The Rumpus, which is a really lovely online journal. Um, it was called Sick. And it did kind of well. Um, I, I heard from the editor that the page got a ton of hits. Um, from there, I tried another essay about the murder, but in a different way, um, specifically about a college uh, dorm or house theme house that we had lived in together, myself and this friend. And I published that as a short piece. And once I did that, I think I determined what the book needed to do. And from there, I took that initial essay about visiting my friend in prison, kind of cracked it open, think of it like an accordion. And then I tucked inside the stretched out single essay you know, research, backstory, how we met, um, you know, re, uh, uh, flashbacks to earlier memories with him. Um, and ultimately that became the structure of my first book. I did the same thing with Mother Trucker. Um, yes. I wrote, right, I mean, I, I took one scene, in this case, it's a really long scene, it's flying to Alaska, doing this trip and flying home. But once again, I sort of cracked that open and inserted into it all the other material. And that for me works in the sense that it gives my project a structure. But I, I really do believe in, in trying to publish shorter standalone pieces as a way of gauging if something is working. Um, what I think it's in, always interesting to see what readers find interesting about your story. So in writing my first book, it was mostly true crime about the murder itself. And finally, I had a dedicated friend and reader say, it's not actually the murder. It's why three years later are you still writing this individual and visiting him in prison? Um, and that was interesting to me because I was trying to write true crime, but really it was about friendship and like, what do you do when someone you know so well does something that is totally out of character to who you know that person to be and what right. then? Um, right. So all I can say, I guess, the pragmatic advice is to put pieces out into the literary world, online journals, lit journals, um, and, and don't aim for what you think you need to. You know, I, I don't send anything yes. to the, <laughs> the Paris Review. like. They're great, but they're not they're not going to publish my piece. What what I'm looking for when I publish little pieces is where are writers that are publishing work that I admire and that is like mine. You know, where right. are the writers who are doing things like me? And that's who I want to that's who I want to find a home with, because those editors or those journals or those outlets value the sort of work that I'm doing. And I can see my work there in their pages. Right. Um, and I, I've, I've seen quite a change, too, even um, since when I was in grad school where, you know, it was aim, aim for those large tiered magazines and stuff first and move down and everything. But now because 
of the internet because of Google search engines and stuff, it's so much easier to find journals that align with what you're writing about. There are so many, for example, we have a, a large science fiction and fantasy fiction, like fiction writing um, student uh, base in our um, at our university and stuff. So there are a lot of those magazines out there readily available. Submit to those, not New, the New Yorker and stuff uh, per right. se. And and um, and I really liked your point too about like the narrative, like writing the narrative and then, you know, stretching it out and then adding the backstory and everything like that. And I think we see that often, um, not to say the New Yorker again, but like um, there there will be um, articles like uh, uh, Patrick Redden Keefe and stuff would start, like he'll, he'll start uh, his larger book of the opioid crisis or something by sharing or by writing a contained piece mm -hmm. originally and having it published in this case in the New Yorker, but having that published and then expanding it into a book and stuff you see that as a common uh theme um for yep. a lot of people so so it, it is something to to definitely pursue i wanted to latch on to one thing that you had said up to about stretching it out like an accordion and putting in the backdrop um mm -hmm. stuff throughout the book i noticed that in in mother trucker as well and um there are several times where where you where you you know consciously pause in the book to recognize marginalized communities in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk about that decision a little bit more and how you were able to, um, you know, did, like, I guess, decide where to fold it into the narrative? And like, is there any advice that you could give uh, for folks um, out there and stuff who who may be writing about a topic, but, you know, it, it's a topic that should be considered from multiple angles and, and, and should be, and those multiple angles should be brought up you know, in recognition and stuff. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm super aware, I think, of the fact, uh, what do I want to say? I'm super aware of my privilege um, in a lot of capacities. You know, when I was writing this book, I really struggled with the fact that I am a white, you know, middle class woman, upper middle class woman who, you know, was in a, a abusive partnership. Um, and what I did was I flew to Alaska and I met up with another woman, uh, also white, and we're, you know, traveling this road that has been built up through ultimately indigenous land, um, talking about domestic violence in a state that has the highest rate of domestic violence than anywhere in the country um, consistently. Um, and, you know, the other thing about it is like we're here in northern Alaska um, and, and the entire time we saw only white individuals and there was no way there was no way around that in the sense that like, that's the story. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, I think partly because I'm in education, partly because I read a lot, partly because I write a lot, I'm always thinking about that larger story. Um, and so for me, it was incredibly important from day one to like acknowledge there is a certain amount of privilege here that I have as a white woman to go on this trip, to embark on this trip, to be driving in this truck. For that matter, I mean, the more that I allowed myself to write about domestic violence and that required a lot of research, the more I realized that like even something, I mean, there's a beautiful writer and researcher, Tressie McMillan Cottom, um, but she writes about how even uh, uh, belief is a certain kind of currency, even credibility belief is a certain kind of currency in the sense that like the second that I, I confided to Joy, to eventually my family, to my friends, that I was in an abusive partnership, I was immediately believed. Um, and for that matter, I had access to resources and support systems um, that made what happened, my, my subsequent sort of departure and, and the life that has continued for me possible in a way that it's not for a lot of women. And so I think for me, like I, it was very evident that I needed to be super transparent and use my voice to advocate for those who might not have a voice without in any way exploiting or trying to speak for those people, which is a really delicate line to walk. Um, you know, I think I didn't know where all of that needed to go in the manuscript. I was hesitant. Um, an initial version had a lot of statistics about the higher rates of domestic violence for women of color, for LGBTQ individuals, um, never mind what it is to be uh, more than, than one of those things, right? Um, and so at first my attempt was research, right? I can't, I can't, I can shine a light on the fact that there are great discrepancies in the way that all of this is treated. Um, but that didn't feel, that felt too clinical. It felt too removed. Um, and so ultimately I just started to get comfortable with kind of indicting myself on the page, criticizing myself a little bit on the page. Um, I think, you know, as a writer, you have to be willing to be incredibly self-critical and be your own worst critic to anticipate what others might say about your piece. 
And again, there's no way around the fact that Joy and I are two white women in this land um, that has been built up for American industry um, and is completely disregarding the native communities that have prospered there for thousands of years. So I just, I wanted to be very honest about that on the page. Um, there are places where I'm kind of outright about it. And then there are other places where I tried to, to insinuate. I think at one point I mentioned that the road looks like a scar across a body because that's what it seemed like in that moment. But it's a really fine line to walk, to be cognizant of there are stories that other individuals um, uh, that are their story to tell. Um, and so my goal is ultimately to try to educate, to try to acknowledge, um, to take responsibility for my own complicitness, um, but also to to use my voice to, to hopefully amplify these issues in, in ways that are responsible and ethical. And we actually have another ethics question um, in the chat that just popped up um, regarding your first book, um, mm -hmm. which I did not um, actually realize that you have, you mentioned this si situation in, in Mother Trucker as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess the question is 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 in regards to like, you know, all of the stuff that is is inaccessible um, to us as writers without having to go through, you know. The rig morale of submitting uh, docu or I, I'm trying to remember what they're called off the top of my head, but like uh, to get government documents and stuff and everything like that. Um, how does one? Act? Is that what yes, you mean? There you go. There you go. Freedom yeah. of Information Act. You can tell it's getting later. It's getting towards my bedtime. Thank you. Uh, yes. Freedom yeah. of Information Act. Yes. Yeah. I should know that. Um, so, anyways, like, uh, you know, not having necessarily. Uh, um, perhaps all of the pieces in place and stuff, but still you're trying to tell the story, you're trying to uh, get it all on, on the page. How, how do you how do you navigate around that um, successfully? Yeah. I mean, I will say, so, so this question is for Blake. I will say, I mean, I, for that first book, I was unable to access those things for the first three years. Um, and then he was sentenced to a plea deal. And at that point, everything became public record. So it really was just about going and asserting, like, I have a right to access this material and thus I accessed it. But what I would also say is there's a lot that can be done. Um, and you mentioned it's a short story, so I'm assuming that it's fiction, um, but also it's about a high profile case, which seems like it's true. Um, there's a lot that can be done with imagination, with suggestion, with implication. Creative nonfiction, awesome. Okay, okay, so that's tricky. Um, I mean, there are different ways to handle it. I always talk to my students about, like, I imagine blank. Like, you can get away with quite a bit there. Um, I mean, I, I haven't written about jury duty uh, in a high-profile case, but I often tell my students, like, just because... Um, you can't write about something or you don't know something doesn't mean that you can't openly wonder on the page. So I use the imagination a lot of times for specifics for imagery. Um, you know, I imagine this, I imagine that. Um, and, and you can get away legally with quite a bit with that language. Um, then there are other instances I worked on my first book and there was a line about, I know without really knowing that Kevin is the reason, you know, and I had a lawyer say, well, you can't know without really knowing and you could get sued for knowing without really knowing. Um, so I don't know to what extent, I don't know how helpful that is for you. I think it's really tricky if there's something that legally you're not able to write about, trying to write about it anyway is hard. I think you would need to corroborate with, with people that are associated with the case in some way. Um, goodness, I don't know how to help you with that one. I'm sorry. Um, I would just say, I, I think, think to extent that information is available. Um, I mean, I was able to access more than I ever would have thought that I could have. Um, but I did have to wait until obviously that all of that was the sentencing was complete. And sometimes it is just a, a, a waiting game, it seems, I, especially with nonfiction. Sometimes you'll see that writers will have to wait and a couple of years until that information is readily available and stuff. But in the meantime, there are other um, uh, things that you can pursue as well. So um, I think it was sound advice. So <laughs> um, I mean, just the language of like, I imagine or I wonder or right. I can't yeah. help but think like there's a lot you can get away with those wiggly phrases um speculating yep make but making it clear that it is speculating or, or considering or reflecting right exactly right. um so there's I, I didn't want to miss this question either so uh and and i think this is uh, um an important one to remember too that not only are you you know a creative non-writer writing these books getting them published and stuff but you are also the director of the creative writing program and associate professor at uh, ohio wesleyan and you also adjunct at SNU. So 
in Rebecca's question, I mean, to summarize or paraphrase, how the heck do you do it? How how do you how so do you tired. find the discipline? <laughs> <laughs> How do you find the discipline? Is that it? Just I mean, just so, tired? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I won't I won't lie. Like it's I have my job in Ohio is a nine to five. I mean, it's yeah. it is and it isn't. It isn't in the sense that I for the most part decide when I will teach and I go and teach. But there are always I mean, there are any number of things that take up 40 hours a week, depending on where I, you know, where I am might change, but the work is still the same. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it really depends. I will say I benefit uh, here in Ohio from a summer. Um, I teach most of that summer, but I tend to teach um, in ways that allow me to at the end of the day. And this is true of Ohio, too, at the end of the day, try to write. Um, but I am not someone who who writes for a living. I, I think there's incredible value in engaging with young students, with older students. Um, I, I don't have an easy answer except to say that it takes time. I mean, it, it took six years between my first book and my second book. Um, I am told it usually takes five to seven for a writer. Um, and I don't know if that means that they have a day job or not. Um, it's hard. I think I'm always, I will say the one thing that I often do is, you know, my phone, like anybody, has a notepad feature. And, um, you know, people are always thinking that I'm texting, but I'm not. I'm jotting down ideas. I'm jotting down sentences. I'm mapping like a structure for something. And most of it I don't use, but some of it I do. And, and essentially, I just have a series of notepad features that when I'm at the dentist office in the waiting room, when I'm, you know, waiting to pick up the pizza or whatever, I'm constantly kind of jotting things down and writing. I also keep a recorder in my car so that when I'm on trips or commuting, I just record, you know, certain things. And again, a lot of it is garbage, but some of it isn't. And it's about being available for those seeds. And then when you time permits, letting them grow, I guess. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I work a full time job and I, I work several jobs in the summer and, and sometimes on weekends. Um, so it really is about like also just giving trusting that these things take time. Um, you know, I, I wrote my book and it came out in November and I haven't written a single thing since and it probably won't happen for another few months. And even then it might just be a few pages. Um, but I, I think that that downtime is also important and honoring that a full life is a life of writing, but everything else that's important, raising family, raising children, caring for, you know, parents and friends and, and all of these these dimensional lives that we live. Um, I think if you're able to write a little bit, you know, uh, from time to time, just a few minutes a day, it, it begins to accumulate. Um, and, you know, if you get a burst of time, that's great. But um, I think a lot of it is just these little moments that begin to combine. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of noticed that uh, as you were uh, speaking and, and it, um, you know, it, it kind of reminded me uh, when I, when I was my MFA, it was always like, I forgot which writer it was, but it's like this writer wrote 500 words a day, no matter what. Christmas, Easter, Easter, it doesn't matter what day it was, he wrote 500 words, and this is the discipline you need to have as a writer and stuff. And and setting yourself up for that is, is like, it's it's setting oneself up for failure and then feeling bad about it afterwards and stuff, yeah. right? But what what you said, I, I think two things that you that stuck out to me was give yourself a break, right? Like, like allowing oneself to have a break between writing projects or even drafting, like just taking a break to step away from it for a couple of days is an important thing to do. The other thing that I, I had heard with having a notebook handy all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of goes along with, you know, the idea of like feeling stuck is not necessarily a thing because there's always something, you know, coming up in the brain and stuff. And to have, to be able to have that notebook handy to write a note down, even if it is something that's throwaway later on, there is something, you you at least have something there that you can look back on and, and it might create a spark where you can then pursue it further and stuff. So. Also, great advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and also yeah. the, la I guess the very last thing that I would say is that, you know, my thesis director told me that the best books to come of theses are, you know, you write 75 to 100 pages for your MA, MFA thesis, and then you throw it away and you start over again with the idea that you have written your way into knowing what your book is and needs to do and be. And now you give yourself permission to start anywhere. But with that prior experience, Again, it's not terribly pragmatic because I recognize that a lot of these things, like I wouldn't have any of my jobs um, without publications and without a book. But at the same time, um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for like not just rushing to fill pages and to, to create a manuscript, but really being careful and intentional about what you're doing. Um, and that was true. I mean, my my graduate school thesis was 90 pages and I think I preserved all of like 20 of them. And I was proud of those pages. 
Um, but I had written my way into understanding what the project actually was, and I needed to start over. Um, I think, you know, it it failed in some ways to, to me when I look back, but it was a lot better than it was. Um, and so again, just, just, I had a friend who said, let the field lie fallow, you know, uh, any good crop is going to benefit from a season off. And it's true. Um, so trying to be patient to the extent that you're able, knowing that these things take time. Um, and again, not being so attached to your work that you can't step back and think, now I know what it is it needs to be, I'm going to start over, um, which again is painstaking work. Um, not always the most pragmatic, but also I think advice we don't hear a lot of. Oh, that hour went by very fast. It, <laughs> it was it, yes, it did. Uh, thank you so much, Amy, for uh, joining us today. We were uh, so, we're so glad to have you here, um, and for reading from your latest book, um, Mother Trucker. Um, I encourage if anyone uh, to who is on this call who has not picked it up yet to go grab it as soon as you can and give it a read. It's wonderful stuff. Um, so thank you again for having us, uh, or for being here with thank us. Thank you for I, having me. <laughs> yes, no problem. <laughs> and I put Amy's uh, website in the chat as well for folks to check out and stuff, so you can, um, you know, see see other uh, resources and stuff on the on the book and everything. Um, so we're all so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, keep a lookout for future Word for Word events as well. Um, our next one is scheduled for April 13th at 8 p.m. and that's going to feature uh, Jeff Vandermeer. So uh, stay tuned for that one as well. But for now, thank you so much, Amy. I hope everyone has a wonderful night and thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.